Welcome back, everyone. This is Chase, and joining me today is Heather Rainey, um, product manager at Obermeyer. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's uh, good to talk to you. Good to meet you. This is kind of the first time that we're actually meeting and, and talking. We've talked a little bit over over email, but um, I guess maybe listeners would find this interesting. But we had Carolyn uh, Allen talk to our program, and and um, she provided some portfolios for our students. Um, that she just highly recommended like great portfolio examples. It was a class all about like how to, how to build your portfolio, what to do, what not to do, um, and how to stand out in the industry. And your portfolios was one of those that was recommended. And I've only heard like just the best things from our students looking at your work and saying how helpful it is. And, um, and when I've looked at your portfolio, I feel like it's unique in a way in the, in the way that it's laid out and, and, just the way that you you display like a variety of your technical design skills, as well as the product management element, which I know you're doing now. So, um, I mean, that's what first drew us in, which I guess is the point of a portfolio. So mission accomplished, right? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to hear. Yeah. But uh, well, we'll take a step back from that a little bit. Um, and just, I, I want to learn a little bit more about how you first got into design. I know that's like interesting for our students. Um, everyone's kind of finds design in a different way and finds the outdoor industry in different ways. Um, but were you always interested in, in design? Um, and then maybe we can touch on the outdoor space. Were you always interested in the outdoor industry? <laughs> yeah, I probably have a more unique background in the fact that my mom was actually, actually a buyer for an outdoor store. Um, so I grew up like around the outdoor industry and like she was a clothing buyer so I was around clothing from a very young age and I always thought it was really cool and then um like growing up I just always was creative and liked drawing but I also really liked math um and everything science researching everything so I mean I was doing like APR in calc 2 in the same semester in high school so I like I knew I didn't want to do a art degree or just like painting or anything, but I wanted something more like tangible. Um, so then I think in high school, I went, um, I grew up in Fort Collins. So I grew up next to CSU and I went to the show for the senior presentations. And I was like, whoa, this is really cool. And it kind of like, it was just everything that I kind of liked and was interested in. And so I like, knew that's where I was going and like CSU was right there and they have a good program. Um, so I went to CSU and you kind of have to apply your first semester and then you get in your second semester. So I applied for design and got in. So it was kind of like a smooth transition and that I like picked what I wanted to do and just like stuck with it. Um, but yeah, I think just growing up being interested in art um, and I also have like my family is architects and um, I've always just kind of been around the design world. So I think that's kind of how I got introduced to it at first. That is like a, a more unique story. Cause when I've talked yeah. to a, a lot of people who get into the outdoor industry in particular, a lot of people don't even recognize like that's an option for them, right? Maybe they are like an outdoor enthusiast and they use the gear. And then after a while, they look at the, this gear that they're using and they think, oh, wow, someone like actually made this thing, right? There, there's an yeah. industry behind this that makes it um, makes it happen. Um, and that's kind of the awakening for for other people. It's interesting that you, and, and I think I've, I'm similar in a way where like I grew up along the Wasatch Front in Salt Lake. And so the outdoor industry is just, you eat and breathe it. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you take it for granted or you don't recognize that it's unique, right? Um, right. Did you have that experience just kind of growing up in, in that environment, growing up in, in Colorado, being in the family, you know, with, with the outdoors being? Yeah, I think I, I definitely like took advantage of it or like didn't understand how like privileged I was to have that um, and to like yeah have parents that introduced it to me at such a young age and like grew up with that and then was able to like go to college in the same town I mean I didn't live at home but like I was so nice to just I'm really close with my family to be there and be doing what I wanted to do but also be I love Fort Collins and be there um 
And so I feel like once I started to get into college and now post-college, I've like really rediscovered like the outdoor space for myself um, and like really learned what I love to do. And I feel like as a kid, sometimes I didn't really appreciate that as much. Um, but now I've come full circle. <laughs> well, are, were there any products or brands that really stuck out to you growing up that it kind of inspired you or, or helped you recognize a, like, oh, like designing product is something that I want to do. Like, I want to be able to make what these people make. Yeah. I remember, um, like I started also in high school, I worked at the retail store. Mm -hmm. Um, it's called Jack's outdoor gear. It's all across Colorado and one in Iowa. So, um, I kind of, I started as a cashier and then I went into, um, our athletics department. So shoes and, um, running shoes and running clothes and all the sports equipment. And then I did footwear and then clothing finally. Um, but I think like my mom would also take me when she learned I was interested in it, she would try and take me to buying meetings. Um, so when I started like meeting the sales reps and then learning, I mean, researching the products, I always loved like Patagonia, Arcteryx and Black Diamond. And I was um, like with my mom when like Black Diamond started reintroducing clothing um, a few, I mean, now it's been a while, <laughs> like 2015, 2014, I can't remember, um, maybe even earlier, but yeah, I just started researching like what these companies were doing and like how much it was involved in the jacket, like Arcteryx. I'm like, why is this jacket $800? And so it's like researching that and learning that I really started to like these companies, but I think that it's cool to work from like a retail perspective. Cause you learn so much about all these brands. And I love like smaller brands too, like Sherpa who are just doing really cool things in their space and for other people um, beyond their company. So I think just a mix of all these cool brands really inspired me. Well, how, how important to you is that retail, retail experience, not only to understand like the landscape, like who are all the, the players, the big ones and the small ones, um, as well as like having that, that, um, experience talking with the customer and hearing what they like that, what they don't like, um, I mean, you got both sides of that on the retail yeah. side and, and you could see like your whole story. I can see like how it helps like culminate in you becoming a product manager, right? Cause you're able to take all these experiences and, and it's like everything that you need to, to, to do and, and the skills that you need to have to be in product management. Yeah, I think it's essential. And that's something that I always like recommended to people, like just get into the space that you want to be in, no matter what aspect that is. So working retail was great um, because yeah, you're learning about a ton of products. You're understanding what a customer wants or what like impacts them. You learn that like you have basically 15 seconds to explain a product to a customer and then you lose their attention and like why it's great. Um, and then like also just knowing, I mean, my mom was a buyer, but then also just knowing like the managers and the buyers and understanding like what their process is and why we might get certain products or why we might not get certain products. Um, like Jax doesn't really do a ton of ski product just because of Fort Collins isn't really like a ski destination. So they'll, she'll, she would have bought like a few North Face, you know, um, and a few Columbia, but not nothing like super high end ski. And a lot of people were like, oh, she should buy this or like, why isn't this shoe here? And it's like, well, it's not really our core customer. So I think it was just understanding a lot more about the whole aspect of retail, buying, selling, all of that. Um, so I think that was a key component for sure. Right, right. So you graduate from your program, like was outdoor always the goal since you had kind of, you'd had the retail experience, like, or were you kind of looking at other other areas of the, the fashion world or, or was outdoor always the destination? Um, I was pretty dialed in on outdoor. I tried like the CSU program mm -hmm. is not focused into outdoor like you guys are. Um, and so I was kind of like in a unique space where not a lot of people were doing it and the instructors were not as, I think now they're getting a little bit more 
um, in tune with that, especially with a lot of brands coming to yeah. Colorado and Denver, but I was like kind of unique in my situation. And so I just remember being like, everybody's making like ball gowns and I'm like trying to make climbing clothing. And <laughs> like, I would go to like Denver to use special machines because we didn't have them at our school. And then like, I was trying to, I remember I tried to make this fleece with like an underarm panel and my instructor like didn't understand. And she asked me to like turn it into a Dolman sleeve. And I was like, that's not what I'm going for. So it was just a lot of like experimental things. Um, but I was pretty dialed in on that. And I had two um, internships in the outdoor space during my time at college. So, and they were both, yeah, outdoors. Um, I did look briefly at like going to a different city. And like, I think if I had done that, I would have focused on like sustainable clothing brands. Um, but still kind of that outdoor sustainability mindset. Right. It's, I, I just had this conversation. We actually just released this today, but a conversation with Sigrid Olson. Um, and she, she's a student over, uh, in, in Europe, um, at a university over there and it's a fashion program. And, but she grew up, um, just wanting to focus on the outdoors and having to kind of customize her degree in a way, which it yeah. sounds like you had to do, um, sounds like there's a lot of value in that at the same time as maybe it's frustrating, right. To like not have all the resources there. I, um, cause I feel like that's just kind of working in industry too, right? Like you just have to figure out how to get stuff done. Do you feel like that ended up helping you in the long run? Like just helping you, um, just kind of develop some resiliency and that ability to just like go and figure out how to get stuff done. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, exactly what you said. It was just kind of like, well, figure out how to make it work or figure out a new way to do it. And it was a lot of like learning and trying and failing and moving on. And then like, I think that that also allowed me to like learn a lot more. And so now I can be like, oh, I think this is either like we're not getting the result we want in the product or we're getting us extremely high cost because of this. And like, I just remember sewing it back in college and being like, it's really hard to do really pretty curved seams with like a knit. So why are we asking the factory to do that and stuff? So I think it did play a part in that, even though like when you're in it, you don't always see that and you're frustrated. <laughs> yeah. I, I know that I, that resonated with me. I mean, that point of like making something yourself and then like that giving you a better appreciation for what the factory can do. Um, yeah. I know that's like a huge focus for our program is getting these students in front of sewing machines, getting them using different prototyping tools, getting them thinking in that mindset of like, well, can this thing even be manufactured? And I'm, I'm right. sure that's so much of your life now, right? It's like that back and forth with, with yeah. factories and um, working with them to ensure that these uh, great ideas that, that you have, like can actually be produced um, and working yeah. in tandem versus fighting against each other. So um, I, I guess like when you graduated, what was it a smooth transition for you into the industry? Like what was, what, what were those months after graduation? Did you kind of have something right out of school or <laughs> take some time to, to have fun for a little while before you jump into a career? Um, it was, I did not get a job out of college. Like I was, it was a struggle. I mean, I did, I worked at the retail store, um, and then. I actually got recruited, I think through LinkedIn maybe, um, to be a assistant buyer for Sierra Trading Post. Mm. Um, and they had a Fort Collins office. And so I was like, might as well do that because you know it pays more. It's another step into that kind of industry. And I had already worked retail for like six years at that point through school and everything. Um, so I moved home to my parents' house and I did that and I applied for so many jobs <laughs> and I interviewed for so many jobs and it was just like, you're great, but we have this person with five years of experience applying for the same job. So get some experience and then we'd love to talk to you again. And it was that over and over and over again. And I was getting like, so frustrated and disheartened. And I was like, I don't know what to do differently. And I was like working and trying to do like some stuff for my portfolio. And then I was also networking a lot with people on LinkedIn who are like in positions that I wanted to be in or just even like 
I'd look up who graduated from CSU and like what they were doing and I'd try and talk to them um, and just like gain insight and I was like listening to all this stuff about like how to interview and how to do this and um, yeah it was a lot and then I was also helping a I was doing a little bit of freelance work for other people who did freelance work. Like <laughs> they just needed help. A freelancer um, for the freelancer. Yeah. <laughs> like a girl that graduated from CSU. Um, she works in Boulder and she does a lot of design, like contract design for people. And so she just needed help like doing tech sketches and stuff because she didn't like that part as much. And I also helped her like with the print development. And then I worked for this woman who has a business again doing freelance and I do like tech sketches for like football, high school football uniforms and stuff. So it wasn't a ton of work, but it was just something for me to do and try and like get some experience. So yeah, and then I finally um, got a job. I got a contract like temporary job with Pearl Izumi because they had somebody going on maternity leave. And so I did a six month contract product development job there um and then it then I moved to Obermeyer but it was yeah it was not super smooth for me <laughs> well I feel like um I mean there's like yeah I mean graduating I think a lot of students just expect that something's going to be there right and a lot of that is just what you're told right that you go yeah. to get a degree and then there's a job waiting for you at the end and it's like not how it usually works um yeah. like there's just so much of what you're talking about like the networking side of things that i don't think gets covered as much as it should um in school which what we're trying to do a lot more of um like how to talk to people how to reach out to people on use like on linkedin like using that like linkedin should be your best friend right to try right. to find these types of opportunities um being willing to take like the freelance opportunity just to get real world experience. Cause I, our students struggle with the same thing, right? They, they look at um, job postings and it's an entry level position, but it requires three to five years of experience. Yeah. Well, that's not entry level. So um, like- And they'll like, find the people that have the three to five years, right, like no problem, right. it seems. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's where I really respect like just the grit, uh, like to, to go and like, just take like the freelance, for the freelance gigs um, because it's that real world experience that I feel like, like sets people apart. Right. And, you know, yeah. when you come out of school, unless you've had two internships, right. Um, you know, that real world experience is what's going to make the difference. And if you do two internships and then for some freelance gigs that can slowly add up yeah. to be a year, two years of, of experience that you can, can actually say, yeah, I have two years of experience. Um, so I, I know that's just, that's really good for our students to hear, right? It's like, just be willing to take those opportunities, be willing to take the, the temporary job. I haven't heard that as much, yeah. but I'm sure that's really common, right? You have people leaving or on leave um, temporarily um, and someone yeah. needs to step in to take the role. And um, did you ever feel like you wanted to be picky about the opportunities or did, were you always of the mentality that I just need to take whatever comes um, and see where it leads? Yeah, I mean, I think a mix of both, like I wasn't willing to just like go do anything and move. I think if I had to move out of state for a temporary job, that would have been different. Right. But um, the fact that it was near me, I was like, I have nothing to lose. Um, and same with the, like the Sierra Trading Post job, like it wasn't what I really wanted to do, but I just knew that I needed to like take that jump and get experience and have, I mean, that's a pretty big name and they're owned by TJX Corporation. So that's a big name as well. Um, and then also just getting the experience. Like I worked a lot on spreadsheets and formatting and talking, like communicating with reps and stuff. So I, and then like I could tailor that experience because I still use Excel when I'm like, kind of documenting research or anything and just being quick at that. And um, yeah, all of that was great. And then also just like communicating with outside vendors as well. Um, so I think all these experiences can, you can learn something from them and take that and apply it to whatever you want. And then, yeah, I just, 
I really wanted the Pearl Izumi job because again, I felt like contract, I knew it was contract and I knew it was temp, but I was like, it's a foot in the door and it gets me another thing on my resume and more experience and closer to what I want. And even if it's just the six months and they don't hire me or I don't want to stay there, that's fine. And it was good. So it worked out to like, I didn't stay there, but I moved on after that. Um, and I think, yeah, since it was in Boulder or Louisville, I moved to Boulder and did that and it worked out well. How did you get to know the the team at, at Obermeyer? How did you come across that position? Was it, you know, once you got into the space and you started working, like more of those connections came about or was it more of you just reaching out to people on LinkedIn? Like how did that, the full-time position come about? Um, I was doing a lot of like applying and again, interviewing more towards like the end. Like, I mean, I feel like interviews in the process takes a while usually. So probably the last few months of the contract work um, when I was like, okay, I'll start interviewing and applying. But then actually um, a professor from CSU reached out to me about the Obermeyer opportunity because they were looking for somebody and asked for recommendations. And so she recommended me and then I started interviewing with them. Um, yeah, so it was a little bit different um, than a normal application, I guess. <laughs> I feel like there's a lesson there, right? Be nice to your professors and do good work yeah. when, you're in, when you're in school because you never know, right? Um, yeah, and keep in touch with them. I mean, I also had a good relationship with her because I set her up with, she was like a merchandising professor. So I set her up with my mom as well to be like a guest speaker mm. for buying. And so then through that, I would talk to her a, a lot. And then I'd go to like every, I'd go to OR a lot. And so CSU usually goes there and I'd say hi and hang out with them. And then I email back and forth with her and a few other professors. So just like keeping in touch with people and networking again, coming back to networking is really good. <laughs> right. Oh, totally. W through this whole experience doing freelance, doing contract, and then landing at Obermeyer, like what was the dream position? Like, was it always design? Was it always product management? Like, I guess, where did you want to land even coming out of school? Like what, what was your hope is that you'd end up doing design and then management or ultimately management was the goal. What, what was the thought there? I don't, I think it changes for me as I go along. And I think I never really, I always liked design and, but I was finding that it was really hard to get into the design space and be a designer. Um, so then, but I, I also like when I started learning more about like product development and stuff, I really liked that as well. And that wasn't really a concentration at CSU. They developed it probably my last year. So I didn't really do that there, but um, I really like tech sketches and I like really wanted to do tech sketches. Um, so I got to do that a little bit at Pearl Zumi. And then um, I took the position at Obermeyer like originally as the fit and tech design person, which is heavily on fit. And so that was, interesting. I think I wasn't still sure what I wanted to do. Um, but once I was in that role and like growing in that role, I just th thought that I wanted a little bit more ownership of the product and seeing the product through and making those decisions. Um, I think I would still like to eventually try and get to a design position potentially. And that's always something that I've been interested in and like to do on the side. Um, but I also, I'm all about just like trying all these different aspects, obviously. So, um, I think this will be a fun transition into more ownership and decision-making in the product. I think that's like important is to just, once you, I, I think like for our students, like you don't actually know what a designer does versus a developer right. versus a, a product line manager. And then within each of those emphasis areas, right? Like there's, there's tech design, yeah. there's fit, there's like, there's so much there that like, you can only cover so much in a, in a program, but you really yeah. start to figure out what those people do when you're actually at a company, right? Whether it's job shadowing or interning, or like you're working there full time. It's like, yeah. then you really start to understand like what those roles actually do and how important they are and how they're connected to, to all the other 
roles as well. So, I mean, there's just such huge value in being open to experiences, right? Yeah. And, and I willing think, to jump around and do a lot of different yeah. things. And they all kind of supplement each other. I mean, I feel like if eventually I do go into a design role, all of this experience will just help me as far as like understanding the product and its life cycle and all the decisions and people behind it. And like, that'll just make you a better designer. And I feel like people who are good designers really have a good knowledge of why this works or how to do this or what sells. So I think it all just kind of is intertwined. Totally. And I, I feel like, well, in product management or product development, it seems like most people who go into those roles transition from design, right? It's like, oh, I start as a designer. That's like the feeder. And then you go off into product management or product development, or um, it's, it kind of seems like that's the direction as people discover those other roles through design. Um, and in order to do those roles well, really well, you have to have like some base level of technical skill on the yeah. design side, right? To be, be effective as well as like have an appreciation for what people within the team do right to be a, a good product manager it's like you have to respect and understand what the designers actually do versus the developers so yeah that's kind of where we find ourselves as as you know helping students kind of guide them along um in that process but um well so what what's your day-to-day -day like now as as a product manager you mentioned offline that obermeyer doesn't necessarily have a design team in-house you're working with designers outside of the company like what does yeah. the day-to-day -day of that look like? And um, I guess what's what's that experience like working with people outside the company? Well, so I'm, like I said, offline too, like this is kind of a new transitioning role for me. So I haven't like fully done that yet. And we'll start ramping up with our next season in a few months. We're trying to finish up one, at least to salesman sample um, tech packs. So I haven't had as much experience yet with like working with out, outside designers, um, but it is interesting just, I've never really worked for a company that's done that. Um, so it is just interesting as far as they go through the design iterations in the summer and then we'll take over for development. And then it's kind of like, they're not involved really. So mm -hmm. the designers, so then it's kind of our product um, and we roll with it from there. And so, that's always been a little bit interesting and different, but um, I think it works for us. Um, but yeah, I'm, I don't have too much to talk about with that yet because I haven't fully transitioned into that. But right now I'm still doing like all of my fit and tech design responsibilities and then training on top of it to start kind of taking over for next season for the product manager yeah well maybe more to come there um yeah <laughs> if we ever do a part two we can get into yeah that right more, so. um well i i wanted to transition a little back to now that we know a little bit more about like your day-to-day -day, like your your path like i, I do want to jump back to your portfolio and um yeah like what what do you feel like really helped you stand out what whether it was getting an internship or like the freelance opportunities or this full-time role like how big of of a deal was it like to have that your portfolio in place? Um, like how big of a factor was that for you? I think it was a big factor depending on which job it was. Mm -hmm. But um, I think like when I got my, I didn't really, I'm trying to remember with my first internship. Um, I'm sure I had some things on my portfolio, but I was like just finishing my sophomore year of college. So I was pretty like new into it. Um, but then like for my second internship, which was right before my senior semester, um, I had made like a special project just for my portfolio for that position. Um, like once I found out that they posted it, I was like, okay, I got to do this. Um, and then, so that helped a lot. And then also, um, just like when I was doing the interview for Obermeyer, um, I kind of turned this research project that I did at Pearl Izumi into a visual. Well, I did a visual at Pearl Izumi to present to people there, but I put it on my portfolio because I thought it was a cool way to show tech design and research in a portfolio. And then I've just always kind of 
whenever I'm working on stuff. It doesn't always make it to the portfolio, but um, I'll try and upload some stuff. Um, I'm not as good as like Carolyn as far as like her Instagram and stuff. I don't have that all together, which is very inspiring, but um, I do have like a sketchbook section that I'll just like upload anything that I worked on. Um, so I think it was um, very helpful and something to like go back to. Um, and I'm always working on it. Um, but then it also, it's just like supplementing your interviews and your resume. Um, and it's just another thing to show what you can do. Right. Yeah, totally. Uh, where, where did you, where did you learn like how to build a good portfolio? I'm sure you cover some of that in school, but, um, I, I just feel like yours has among the, a lot of the portfolios that I've seen has really stood out. Um, and part of that might be the layout, but also just like the, the quality of the work in there. Um, the mix of like, um, like concept sketches with the more technical drawings with the research. Like, I just think like, I just super well done. Like, where did you learn how to build a, a unique portfolio that really stands out? I think it's come from a lot of different places and people. I, I think like we didn't to do a ton of portfolio work. I mean, we did in the sense of like, we had a fashion illustration class and we'd make a portfolio that way, but it was always like the hand portfolios. And then we did a portfolio like when I was applying for the, or for the design program. Um, but again, those were all like paper tangible portfolios. Um, so then like when I started, I th when I started working with this woman who did the technic or the freelance design, I first had met with her just to have her like as a mentor and like to ask her questions, um, since she graduated from the program and she lived in Boulder. Um, and I like asked her what she uses for her portfolio and she said carbonate. And so then I was like, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> so I made that. And then, um, I think as I was applying to positions and then like, they'll, sometimes they'll like move you along to do a, a design kind of concept for them. And then I wouldn't get the job. So then I'd just like finish the portfolio and like upload it to my website. Um, be like, whatever they, these people can see it. <laughs> um, and then I started learning. I don't know. I think I started learning like my second internship was at Patagonia and my director there, he's no longer at Patagonia, but he was great. And I think I learned kind of like the importance of the concept um and showing the rough and messy stuff because people that's the whole point of design is to like see where you're coming from and how do you like show your ideation or where does your mind go and so I think and that's something I still like want to improve on but I think just like not showing the finished product because that's ultimately not as important when you're looking for a role as showing like how you got there in the process um, and he was really good at, as far as like, he would just like on a sticky note, draw something really messy, but you like understood what he was trying to communicate. And so learning how to do that is super helpful. So then I kind of made the sketchbook idea and it's still something like that. I'd like to do more of, I think sometimes when you're applying and you're doing these quick, like portfolios for brands, it's like, you have no time to put it all together. Um, but at least I can show like, this is kind of where I'm coming from. Yeah, if that to makes sense. it totally does. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I, I kind of, I really agree. Like on the sketching side of things, I don't know. There's something about a paper pencil sketch that like, like even like digital sketching procreate, like it looks really good, but for some reason, like, I think I see a paper pencil sketch and I, I think, wow, you like, you, you could do that really quickly on paper. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's like, I, for some reason, I, it just makes you think of a, a sketchbook and the process and um, like a person's ability to like quickly get those ideas out on paper versus like something digital that, you know, granted people can do a lot of really cool things quickly digitally, but I don't know, like a sketchbook, I feel like communicates that, that ability to quickly get ideas 
out right. on paper and, and you're a quick communicator in that way. Um, I don't think that's always the case, but for some reason, that's what's communicated to me when I see like some of those rough sketches, um, yeah. in addition to all the other technical skills um, that, that complement that and are, are important as well. But yeah, I don't, like what, what are other things that you really look at um, or, or you feel like really help portfolios stand out? Having, having a portfolio that I think stands out. <laughs> um, I mean, I think sometimes my portfolio goes against the grain and a little bit because like a lot of people tell you to be like super focused in on your portfolio where mine isn't always that way. Like it's, it's pretty much apparel centered, but I have all the different like layout or the different tabs as far as projects and so I'll have like tech design fit, like research projects. And then also if I'm like working on a design project on my own, I'll upload it. Um, and so I think I haven't like necessarily done the same thing, but in a way that's good because it shows like variety. And at the end of the day, like if you're working for a brand, you're not necessarily designing for yourself, you're designing for that brand. And so understanding different consumers and not just designing for the same thing over and over again. Yeah. I think I got kind of stuck with that in college where I was like always designing for the same like market. And then you have to learn like, just because you're that demographic or you like that doesn't mean that that's what the brand you want to work for is targeting. Or like if they're trying to do a capsule collection for another type of consumer to try and get that you might not agree with that or you don't love that but that's what you're designing for yeah so I think like showing diversity in your portfolio as far as that and really like honing in on who your consumer is and different targets can be great and as far as standing out as well where did um yeah, like there's there's something about like for designers, like half the battle is just being a good observer, right? And like that's a hard thing to teach, right? It's like you yeah. can tell people all day long, like, no, you need to observe what's going on in the market, right? And then like tease out insights of like, okay, what does this mean based on what you're seeing? But how much of that is just you just gotta be in the industry to really, really start picking that up. I think there's a lot that you can do as a student to just observe. Um Cause I, cause I really think that is half the battle, right? It's just like observing people and how they use products and yeah. identifying those pain points. And, but some of that doesn't really come into focus until you're like in the position and like having those conversations with other designers who have done it a lot longer. Yeah. And again, I think like starting out in retail too, mm -hmm. you really yeah. get to know more of the consumer and then it's interesting, like learning from them, but then like also seeing the designers who are trying to market to them and, but also pushing for something new and change. So I think just like, as I've gotten experience and like worked for a lot of different brands and a lot of different aspects, like I just always am trying to be curious and like questioning and asking people like, why are you doing this? Or like, tell me about this more, um, whether that's like, I just got back from like a backcountry ski trip. So I'm like asking them, like, why are you using this gear? What do you like about it? Versus like the designer, like, why are you designing this? What is the push? So just always asking questions and being curious and yeah, observing like these conversations and meetings about why we're trying to make this product and who it's for. And sometimes you can pick up on like, well, they don't really have a clear vision for who this is for. So it might not sell as well, or we might not do as well with this category. So it's interesting to see that kind of whole timeline. Right. Well, it's so much easier to just lean back on, I'm going to make this thing because I think it's cool, right? Versus the, like the critical thinking involved in observation. Cause it's not yeah. just like observing and being like, oh, that person's using this product. It's like, well, why are they using it? And yeah. you know, for what, you know, there's so much more like deeper thinking that goes into it. Um, but yeah. hopefully you know, through design school, like you learn like how to think more deeply and think critically. And, yeah. Um, I, I hope we're accomplishing that. I think we are, but um, yeah, there's, there is a lot more like deep thinking about like why people do what they do. And, and then the other aspect that probably falls more under like what you're doing with product management is like just understanding the market, right? Like who are all yeah. the players and 
and I imagine you get a lot of that experience like on the retail side, but a lot of that is just like putting in the time to learn who all the different companies are and what market segments they're they're playing in. Um, yeah. And that's just probably comes with time, right? And a lot of digging yeah. and you know keeping up with, with the industry. And just like, yeah, I mean, with me always having being interested in that, just always from a personal standpoint, being curious about what brands are doing and yeah, at retail level, like I was always looking at the catalogs or like on the internet, like reading about the products that we got and like all of the technical stuff. And then, yeah, as a consumer myself, just like figuring out what I like or what's on the market, um, which always helps me in my job. And yeah, I own a lot of jackets and <laughs> I consume a lot of that outdoor product as well. So I think that just like helps me to understand the market too. Right. Yeah, totally. Um, I was, I was going to say, like, I was just talking to a student recently and, and he, you know, he got into our program and he's trying to um, really revamp his portfolio now and like take it to the next level. And, and we were talking about like how to take your projects and, and just dive deeper and like add more depth to them, add more, um, I like tie them to a brand, tie them to a, like a real problem, tie them to real people, like really ground the projects more in those things. Um, and like for students who are like, aren't working for a company, that's really hard sometimes. Like, like when you're working for a company, you're given that design brief and you're saying, Hey, create for this person, right. For this yeah. purpose. Um, when you're a student, like, did you find yourself having to like manufacture, like design problem or like identify or like kind of make up like, okay, I'm working for this company and I've been tasked to like solve this problem. And, and I don't, this is probably a bad example, but I look at your glove project and mm -hmm. I could see how a student, um, even if they're not working for Pearl Izumi could say, okay, well, I'm going to just pretend that I'm working for a company um, and, and treat this project as if I was working for them. And I'm going to focus on like this one product segment, like market segment yeah. and just first start with the research and just try to understand like the market and then try to identify some holes from there. And that's maybe where I get my, my design idea. That was a very long question. Um, well, not even a question, but like, <laughs> is there a good way or a way that you recommend students try to like create those types of real world experiences for themselves pre internship? If that makes sense. Yeah. I feel like that's something that I didn't do a lot of, which I probably should have. And like now probably would do more of that. Um, but yeah, I think just like having a yeah pretend or real company in mind, like and a consumer and kind of really diving into like what that consumer would want. Like I, I said, I had made a portfolio project specifically for my Patagonia internship, like before I applied. So that was like, oh, I want to intern there. So I'm going to make this project and think of them like as my consumer um, and what they would need. Um, so I kind of did that, but <laughs> um, I think, yeah, if you can almost like come up with your own design brief and also using, I don't know, I'm sure you guys have like trend forecasting available, but I wish we had more. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a little pricey. So we haven't I know. been able to get access as much as we would like. But I think it, when I was in college, they actually accidentally bought WGSN. Okay. And so then my professors were like, everybody use this every day. So they like <laughs> see a high use and then they had it ever since. So it was That's a, a good problem. accident for the students. I'm sure yeah, that, it was there great. were some heart attacks on the administration <laughs> side, but worked but out. Like, even if you don't have a trend forecasting website, like using Instagram, looking at what people are doing, like these, there's so many creators on Instagram and like people in these like more niche spots, like you can take so much inspiration from that. And like, I know that we have WGSN here, but like not even using that as much for the outdoor industry, except for maybe when it comes to like color. Um, but I just think like looking at your surroundings and being inspired by people. Like I always have like notes in my phone or like I'll voice record things when I have ideas and just like always taking note of what I'm observing or if I have ideas. And then you could kind of like 
compile some of those or have a list and choose from that and develop that and research it into more of a concept. Yeah, there's there's a lot of ways I feel like that you can kind of bootstrap it yourself, right? It's like there's tons yeah. of people now, to, like there's more people than ever talking about the industry, right? And talking about like, yeah. I mean, there's there's any number of podcasts that would be would be good, like different Instagram accounts, like free reports that are out there. Like there's ways that you can kind of cobble some of that together. I think like there's more information than ever. Um, it's like how to find the right information, how to piece it together, yeah. um, and then how to interpret it, right? So. Um, that's, yeah, I, I think there's a huge opportunity for our students to, to do more of that for sure, but that's so much of your world, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they better, better to start practicing that now or getting into that mindset of like, I don't know, um, looking for those, um, I don't know, I'm trying, I'm blanking on, on the term, but I think you get what I mean. So, Yeah. I'm always like looking for inspiration. <laughs> yeah. Like even if I'm in a thrift store and I see something and I don't want to buy it, I'll just take pictures or like kind of jot something down either on paper or in my head and just like, who knows, I might use it. It might be like five years from now, but just, yeah, seeing what's out there. Well, I think I'm glad that you mentioned that too. That was one of my questions, for, right? It's like finding design inspiration. It's like, and I think that's a question that gets asked a lot. It's like, how do you find it? But then how do you like store it so that you can retrieve it later is I think the the other thing that's hard to do, right? It's like, or like just yeah. being in that state of mind where, yeah, I'm going to, I will take a picture of something when I see something that's interesting. Like sometimes I think we're just not in that mindset of, oh, I should save that for later. And then setting up a process for yourself to be able to go and like find that material when you need it later on, right? Yeah. Um, I know yeah. that I've, I, I know Instagram has been good about you know, you can save posts. I've been saving posts so much, right? It's like in create yeah. folders, but there's different tools. It's just all about finding your own process, I imagine. Yeah. And I think mine's kind of all over the place. Like yeah. I'll um, print out images sometimes, or like anytime I'm working on a project, I use like one of those expandable like folders. And I just always yeah. keep anything. Like, even if I think it's stupid, I just like keep it there. So I have stuff from like my freshman year of college but it's nice to just like look back and see what I wanted to do or like regain inspiration. Or like I said, sometimes I'll leave myself voice memos. So I was like just listening back to something from like 2016 that I said, and then I'll have like notes app in my phone. So I'm kind of like, I don't have it all in one place, but I also feel like whenever something hits you, like just do whatever you can to write it down and figure it out later. <laughs> right. Well, that's, that's like inc an incredible level of like self-awareness and, and self-reflection, um, which I think more designers could, could use and um, would benefit them long-term, but I know we're pushing up against an hour here. I don't, I don't want to keep you a few, if you have. Yeah, I, I do actually have another okay. meeting at 12. Okay. Well, we'll wrap up here. <laughs> I, this has been great. We can always do another one too. There's like so much more we could dive into, but this has been fun. I'm going to include, uh, if it's all right, a link to your portfolio if people want yeah, to take a look. And from there, they can stay in touch you, with you that way, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay, perfect. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. Yeah, great to talk to you. Thanks for being willing to, to share your experience. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm.